Okay, so welcome everyone. Just to begin, please take a moment to either say a small prayer inwardly or just practice a moment of mindfulness. Just give yourself a minute to enter into some inner silence, inner space. This is not just a conversation you're listening in on. This is a gathering you're participating in. So just take a moment to fully arrive and create some inner space and silence. And if there's a particular intention that evoked your heart to want to be here today, give that some space too. So let's give that a full minute. I'm going to gently draw your attention back to my voice, to your screen, to tune in to the presence of all who have joined in on this call. So, welcome to this webinar with Satish Kumar and Thomas K. Shore, The Courage and Magic of Pilgrimage. This event today is part of our Faith and Moral Courage series supported by the Fetzer Institute. I would like to offer Fetzer our gratitude for making this webinar possible. This event forms part of a larger event series exploring what faith and moral courage look like in an age of polycrisis. Where does extraordinary courage come from? What can we learn from people who've risked everything to live up to their values? What forms of courage are especially needed in our age of unraveling, uncertainty, and risk? How can we inspire ourselves and each other to grow our capacity to brave our limits? Are there insights from the world's spiritual and faith traditions that can help us grow our courage? Fortunately, the wonderful and incredible speakers we're joined by today, Satish and Thomas, are both individuals who have lived courage to an extraordinary degree. They have braved their limits to explore pilgrimage, to live up to their ideals. Thomas <clears throat> Kishore who spent time with Ed Spencer. This was an individual who very much did not compromise on what his heart knew to be highest and to follow through on that. Satish Kumar, who went on his incredible peace pilgrimage and the service that he has given to the world since then are all examples of living from a place of deep faith and courage and having that inspired by by traditions such, such as Jainism and, and Gandhianism and offering that to the world. And I'm very excited that all of these seats will be present there for us all to explore together during this webinar. Pilgrimage is something so ancient, so ingrained. I was reflecting this morning upon how when you are immersed in pilgrimage, you are immersed in something so much more primal and, and natural than any concept or language or dogma, you know. Pilgrimage is part of religions and spiritualities around the world, and you can read literature upon it, you can 
see and learn through history and what wisdom says on it and there are conceptual frameworks too and there are books but really when you engage in it all of that scaffolding just falls away and whether you are a muslim or a christian or a pagan or a zoroastrian on pilgrimage you are tapping into the core the vein that source that pure water that is colorless, that is beyond any of the labeling and the naming that all these traditions so beautifully arrive at. It just goes right to that jugular, to that vein of people and the planet and where this contact between us and the earth takes place with each and every falling footstep. So with that, I'd like to dive into the first prompt and question, which is, when you undertake pilgrimage, what role do courage and faith play in every step? When your foot sets on the ground, at that first moment of undertaking pilgrimage, all the way through to when you have completed it, what is the attitude in your heart? And how does that attitude determine the destiny of your walk, all the places it touches, and the impact that it has on the wider world? I would love to start uh, with you, Satish. Thank you, Michelle. Um, wonderful question and a wonderful um, uh, event to talk about pilgrimage and courage. Uh, to answer your question, First of all, to be a pilgrim, you need to let go of all expectations. Because there's a difference between being a tourist and being a pilgrim. Tourist is traveling, going to places with some expectations. But a pilgrim accepts place, people, life, as they present to you. And that requires a lot of courage. So, in a way, a whole life is a pilgrimage. But symbolically, we undertake pilgrimages to highlight the reality that actually whole life is a pilgrimage. And as you said, Michelle, that uh, whichever religion you come from, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, all religions have risen and transcended from the labels and many, many saints, pilgrims, and wise people in those religions, they have undertaken pilgrimages so, I mean, I undertook a pilgrimage to Mount Kailash in Tibet. And uh, I walked from Nepal seven days to Tibet and then four days around Mount Kailash as a kind of circumambulation, climbing up to 18,000 feet high glacier and then coming back and then walking seven days back. So in order to undertake pilgrimage, I think walking is a very good way to, uh, to let go of any time constraints, any kind of idea of destination. So every step is a step for, of pilgrim. Every step is a step of pilgrimage. So destination, of course, I have also uh, undertaken uh, a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela on Camino. And there as well, you have the same feeling that every step you are going is a pilgrimage. And, and reaching Kailash, Mount Kailash, or reaching Santiago de Compostela is only a kind of, um, it's a kind of uh, um, gift, you can say, as a kind of conclusion of a gift 
but every step is a pilgrimage. And, and, and when you are a pilgrim, you let go of any judgment. You are not judging this, that, right, wrong, good, bad. Because life, all our judgments and all our mental exercise is discriminatory. But for pilgrim, ups and downs have to be taken with equanimity. Because when you are going in Mount Kailash, you are up, 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 climbing, and then you down, 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 going down. And, and that's a kind of metaphor for life. Life is full of ups and downs. As a, as a pilgrimage is ups and downs. And so taking ups and downs, high and low, pain and pleasure, gain and loss, um, whatever comes, they are all opposites, taking them with equanimity, that requires a lot of courage. So I would say, and a very briefly answering to your question is that you let go of all expectations and you accept life as it comes, people as they are, nature as it is, hills, mountains, meadows, fields, flowers, bushes, thorns, everything is part of life. And when you can have that equanimity and accept life, then you get a kind of joy, kind of transcendental joy that you get. Because joy, joy is not when something is good and you think it is good and therefore I enjoy it. And when something is bad and I'm sad about it or, or pained by it. But when you can accept ups and downs of pilgrimage, and life's ups and downs, and accept life as a pilgrimage, then I think it's a kind of transcendental joy. And that's a kind of fruit of pilgrimage. That's so beautiful, Satish. Thank you. It would be so wonderful to hear your reflections now, Thomas, on how courage and faith has informed pilgrimage for you and yourself and what you've witnessed in others? Yeah. Well, um, I guess I could start by saying um, my first experience with something that I would call a pilgrimage, because at first when you said this was going to be about pilgrimage, I thought, um, what do I really know about pilgrimage? And then I realized that in a way, um, all that, that Satish was just saying is something that I also have experienced um, to a a limited degree, or I could say I've, I've had my moments of having that bliss on the road, but I can't say that I'm a fully transformed person who has, um, you know, been able to realize that all of the time. And I could I could just sort of tell the, the story of how I really came to what he's, he, he's talking about when I had a very close in, in, encounter and time with someone who I would say was one of the few people I've ever met that was a real um, pilgrim in the way that Satesh is, 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 is talking about. And it really sort of started when I was about 21 years old. And I guess you could say, you know, I was raised um, in a uh, atheist family, you know, um, secular humanism, I guess you could say was our religion. So I'm not really a person of faith, but I'm somebody that did have from an early age experiences that I would say had something where you could call them spiritual experiences or elongation of the time of childhood wonder that it was never quite uh, beaten out of me. So I sort of always had that. So I was always looking for something very whole. And I and and that set me always on my feet of traveling then. And I had gone to Greece and I was um, actually felt um, was on the island of uh, Corfu. And there's the, the highest mountain on, on the island is called Mount Pantocrator, which is one of the names of, of God. It means the, um, the all powerful. So it's like the all powerful mountain. It was the highest mountain there. And I felt drawn to go up there. 
And I climbed up this mountain. And when I got to the top, I saw that there was some sort of a fortress. And then I saw there was a monastery. And then I saw there was one old um, Greek Orthodox monk living up there. And he invited me to live up there with him. And so I lived up there with him for a couple of months. And then it was winter coming and I had to leave. And I got onto a boat. I actually went back to Italy to renew my passport and came back and happened to sit down next to this elderly man who happened to speak English. And he was actually American. And um, at first, I didn't really know what to make of him because he, he looked like a, like a bum. He was sort of in clothes that looked like from Salvation Army. And he had just a little pack with, with him. And we started talking and he asked me, you know, where I was going. And I told him I had just come from this mountain. And he started asking me very probing questions about sort of the inner dimensions of what I had experienced there. And then I realized that this is no ordinary person that I had run into. Um, and he uh, and then he explained that that he was uh, on his way to India. And um, he was 70 years old. I was I was 21. I didn't know who this guy was. And within an hour of meeting him, he, he said, I think you should come with me to India. And I sort of realized I didn't have much of a choice, that this was sort of a, a fateful occurrence happening. And um, and he it turned out that he was an ex. He was a he had been a Harvard professor and he had been in India during World War Two driving an ambulance and he um, had met a teacher there and had left everything in the West and had gone to India um, to, to live. And he told me how, how he had wandered uh, without any money across India, like the sadhu really. And, um, and so, and he didn't really believe in, in money. His, his credo was take the money out of your pocket and put yourself in the hands of the unknown. And um, and so when we were on the boat, this all sounded really, really like amazing and wonderful to my 21 year old self. And I thought, what an amazing man this is. And then we got off the, the boat and neither of us had any drachma in our in our pockets. And then there was like a little kiosk where the where where the boat was to change money. And I said, hey, Ed, his name was Ed Spencer. I said, you know, hey, you know, we have to stop here to uh, to change some money because I knew that he had some traveler's checks. He actually had some money with him and and to buy his ticket to India. And I had traveler's checks and he sort of turned to me and said, you know, what do we need money for? And I had said, you know, well, to eat, to find a place to to sleep. And he sort of made the concession to me and said, oh, OK, you know, uh, we could also do that. And we changed the, the money and he handed me the, the money un, uncounted and said, here, you be our official money carrier. And then, uh, and then there was like a, a bus that was going to take us into Athens. And I said, hey, you know, there's the bus. It would cost a few drachma, practically nothing. And, and he just kept walking like he wasn't going to put up with that. And I would have jumped on that bus and forgotten about him, I, I think, except for the fact that I had all of his money. So I couldn't. And then we, we, we went and there was a through this you know, the dock area of, of, of this place. And then there was a truck going by and we waved it down. We got in and um, and I and then I asked him, you know, where are we where are you going? We went we got in without even knowing where. And he said to Athens, which is where we were going. And Ed sort of gave me a look like, you see, this is how it works. And then the, the driver had a big loaf of bread and he broke off a piece and handed it to us. And we had food and transportation and everything for nothing. And anyway, then we ended up going to India and um, and we went walking into the south. Um, and I was not a very good disciple the whole time when we were in the rural areas. I, I had the experience of the bliss of 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 this traveling with with nothing and leaving yourself completely open to chance and to the goodwill of others. Um, so that was sort of my introduction into this uh, kind of aimless wandering, which then I also later in, in life, I experienced this uh, again once up in Sikkim. And um, 
like I, I understand that bliss that Satish was talking about of having no aim, no, nothing you do now has any impact on what happens in the next day because you're really traveling in, in the moment. And um, anyway, I hope that says a little bit about it to you, so. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much for both of your reflections on that first question. I had another question, but because you've both spoken so beautifully about that bliss, and you've both witnessed others on pilgrimage undertaking it yourself, I want to see how that bliss, when it is shared, changes how people meet each other. So just take a couple of minutes each to respond to this, please, and then we will proceed with the next question that I had lined up for you. So Satish, when you first crossed the border from India into Pakistan, you'd had that conversation with your friend five minutes before you crossed the border where she was really worried because a war was going on between India and Pakistan at that time. And they were like, how are you gonna be greeted? Is it safe, et cetera, et cetera. And then you describe a very, very beautiful encounter in your book. You know, you were greeted by somebody who had heard your news days before and was there waiting for you because this person essentially also wanted to be a peace pilgrim in their own way. And That's so fine. pilgrimage had brought out that that and that bliss that you tapped into had tapped into something else in another human being and and a whole new possibility was then made available to you That's similarly fine. Thomas you know when you have listened to the stories of uh, for, of the um you know the 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 people who had gone with the with the lama <laughs> trying to find Baal um in the in that calling were, were there instances of them kind of rising above any any community differences or finding like a shared narrative or when you were with Ed you know was was similarly did you have encounters with with others where something in them responded to something inside of you and there was a, a meeting of human beings rather than of our perceived kind of identities and what sets us apart so uh, if you would if you could comment first Satish and then we'll go to Thomas okay um the story you are mentioning Michelle is the story of my pilgrimage for peace which took two and a half years uh, to complete and and it started from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi in New Delhi and ended at the grave of John F. Kennedy in Washington DC and uh, when I was setting off on my this journey, my teacher, sort of Indian sort of guru, my teacher guru, Vinoba said to me that you are going for peace. Wars begin in fear. Peace begins in trust. How are you going to show the world that you trust? A pilgrim has to have trust in his heart. So one way to show and to practice trust is to go without any money in your pocket. And that was quite a sort of surprising advice. But anyway, he was our teacher. He was our guru. And he says that if you want to really work for peace, then you have to trust. And you have to show trust. And not that other people should trust, but you need to trust. So we decided to go without any money. So we started walking from uh, New Delhi, from the grave of Mahatma Gandhi. We came to the border of India and Pakistan. And many of our friends and family members and colleagues, they came to say goodbye. And one of them was a very dear friend of mine, a woman called Kranti. And she was very worried. And she said to me, Satish, you are crazy. You are going to Pakistan and our enemy country, Muslim country, and you, and you are going without any money. How are you going to survive? Forget Vinoba, forget your teacher. Take some money, take some food. 
and particularly she brought some food because in India generally you take some food with you. So it's a lovely sort of food, wonderful smell. I said, take some food, take some money. And I thought for a minute and then I said, no, because how how many how much money two and a half years of journey eight thousand miles fifteen countries how much money can I take, and how much food can I take? So I said no, no, thank you. I have to go without any money. And so I said that if I don't get any food one day, I will fast. That will be my opportunity to fast. And if I don't get a shelter, sometimes I sleep under the stars. And that'll be my million star hotel. <laughs> Who cares for five star hotel? And if I die while walking, I say that the best kind of death that I can have, dying while walking for peace on a peace pilgrimage. She started to cry. I said, why are you crying, Kranti? I'm going, you are not going. She said, Satish, this might be our last meeting. You are going through these mountains, through deserts, through snow, through forests, through all these kind of no money, Muslim countries, Christian countries, communist countries, capitalist countries. How are you going to survive? And so she started to cry. And I said, look, if I don't come, don't worry. If I die, I'll die. But I'm walking for peace and pilgrimage for peace. And that's what you, Michelle, said about courage. So you have to have a courage. Anyway, I said goodbye to all my friends and, and colleagues and family members. And the moment we arrived in Pakistan, just as, as Thomas was saying, quite amazing coincidence, somebody waiting for us, I mean, there were two of us, somebody waiting for us, I say, are you the two pilgrims who is walking, coming to Pakistan for peace? And I said, yes, we are. But how did you know? I mean, it's amazing. We don't know anybody in Pakistan. We have written to nobody. We have nobody's address. And here you are, you know about us. He said, I read about you. I heard about you. I thought, oh, you are working as a peace pilgrim. I'm a peace pilgrim. I'll come and welcome you. I want you to come to my house. And so that's how that I mean, story is in my book. Uh, long story, um, a pilgrimage for peace. But what I felt at that time was that if I come to Pakistan as an Indian, I meet a Pakistani. If I come to a Muslim country as a Hindu, I meet Muslims. But if I come as a human being, as a pilgrim, I meet everybody a pilgrim as a human being. And that is how two and a half years without a penny in my pocket and in our pockets, going through Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Russia, Moscow, Belarus, Poland, Germany, Belgium, France, um, England, America, Tokyo to Hiroshima and back to India. All that happened two and a half years of journey on trust, complete trust, without fear. You can call it courage. Well, I mean, we did not think that we are courageous. It was a, other people say you have courage. But that was a kind of humble journey for two and a half years. And as Thomas said, we actually literally had, we don't touch money. When Bertrand Russell said to us, we met Bertrand Russell in England, and he said to us, you come from India to here, you've been walking, but how are you going to go to America without money? I said, we don't know, but we will not take any money. He said, I want to give you some money. Bertrand Russell said, I want to give you some money. I said, no, sir, we cannot take any money. But if you want to, to give us two tickets, we will be very gr grateful. And so he arranged two tickets in Queen Mary for us. We took no money, but he arranged it. And so you can see I mean, we, that in America, we met Martin Luther King. And it was a wonderful, great privilege, great honor to meet some, somebody like that. So I think to be a pilgrim is to trust. Trust at the moment in our society, we are suffering from trust deficit disorder. And if you have no trust, you cannot be a pilgrim. 
And whatever problem comes, difficulties come, you welcome them. Problems welcome, difficulties welcome. Life and pilgrimage is not a smooth journey. But if you have that trust in your heart, courage in your heart, and core is heart. Core is heart. And everybody has a heart. So we all have a potentially courage, but we don't cultivate it. So that's the kind of beautiful journey that that journey taught me more than anything else. Those two and a half years were the real university of life and the university of a pilgrimage. Beautiful. Thank you, Satish. The pilgrimage makes you a student of trust, a devotee of trust, I suppose, and that builds bridges amongst human beings. Thomas, what are your reflections? Just on that, I can say that um, I, I think that being on the road traveling in such a way with with nothing and not spending anything and, and not knowing even where you're going or what's going to, to happen is sort of the most radical thing that you can do to open yourself up to the vagaries of existence to then have to rely on that trust to see what then comes and to sort of understand that the universe somehow will up, uphold you like it there is something will 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 come that's been my experience anyway um and i think uh i mean that that's really something that i learned from from ed from traveling and later traveling on my own in a similar fashion um is that it's it, it's really uh how to put it to um because you're, it, it's like the basic things of food and shelter are unknown and unforeseeable. And when that's the case, then it's like if you live in a, in, in a house and you have your food secure, you, you can't really learn that, that lesson that, um, that, that, the, that things will happen, which will you know, buoy you and, and, and keep you alive. And so I and I think that um, that when you travel in such a way, I think it's also something that 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 sense of freedom, I think, is something that everybody in their heart longs for, but people don't often I experience it. Like, I think I, I have experienced it. I think Satash has probably in his two and a half years has um, and probably in his subsequent travels maybe has uh has had more experience of, of that than I. But um, I, what I find is that there's something also that when you're opening yourself up to the universe in that, in that way, other people um, can realize what you're doing and can sort of uh, find inspiration in, in that quite easily because most people have never had that experience whatsoever. And um, and I found that, you know, while traveling that that way that, you know, people are my experience has been that people have been very, um, you know, open to uh, to what you're you're doing and, and they feel sort of like there's some kind of an ideal in it. And so I don't know if that answers. I your totally question. agree, Thomas. That's absolutely true, because uh, I was looked after by the strangers in strange countries. And they knew that that was the only time I was meeting them. I will never see them again. I will be gone yes. and never come back. And yet they will give me food and shelter and, and hospitality and organize meetings and talks and, and so on and so on. So yeah. I think when people realize that you are a pilgrim and you are walking without money, suddenly yeah. their generosity and their magnanimity and their hospitality and awesome. their love emerges. Yes, it, it absolutely glosses. I, I really experienced this um, also like traveling with Ed. I don't want to keep going back to him, but he, he was a quite remarkable character. But very often, you know, when, when we were traveling, we, we went from Bombay south into the kind of into the heart of, of South India in that first trip when I was walking with, with him. And many times, you know, we would go into a little village and and like Ed would never beg and we never begged. It was sort of like unless something comes your way, then then you would also take nothing and, and you would have nothing. And he had told me times when he was really at the point of starvation and almost dying from nothing coming his, his, his way. And he was 
somebody that I would say that had like the highest ideals of anybody that I've ever met and the strongest will. And I think those two things very much went together that he was willing. He had this ideal about, about love really that the, that the human intercourse should be based on, on loving relationships. And if you have money, like if I give you so many rupees and you give me so many bananas, that that's not a an, an open, uh, fully loving uh, exchange. And um, and there were, you know, so there were times when nothing came his way and he really existed. He told me stories of, you know, being in, when he was in Rajasthan in the middle of the hot season and, you know, without anything and practically dying. And he was willing to go to that point, not to compromise his ideals. And I, I never reached that point. I'm far too much of a practical person, but I did sort of uh, have that experience of traveling with him and getting a, a, like a, a, a glimpse of what that was. I mean, he was really willing to die for his ideals, which was extraordinary to me. Um, and, uh, and so, but I did experience, you know, we, we would travel and someone would put us up in a, in, in a village and, and invite us to, to their house. And in the morning with tears in their eyes, they, they would, you know, really in, implore Ed to please stay. They would build a hut for him. He could stay there. If he got sick, they would take, take care of him. And I think they, 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 they just, you know, wanted, they, they could see the, the realization that he had. Um, and, you know, through that, that way of, of, of traveling and actually like what happened with, with him is, you know, he had a teacher, a Bengali teacher in, in Bihar actually, who had moved there after partition. Um, and, and he ended up leaving his, his, his teacher, which I think is always a, a wise thing. I'm not someone who's ever had a guru or would ever be able to, I guess maybe it's my secular nature. But he also left his 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 teacher, and he really did describe to me how he um, he he had uh, he left with just a little bit of money in his in his pocket when he when he left walking from there, and he had a point where he had one one coin left in in his pocket, and he was walking into a little village, and there was a beggar at the edge of the village, and he reached into his pocket to give the beggar something, and he realized it was his last coin. It was like his his last linked to anything. He had given up all of his relations in, in, in the West and had given up Harvard and all of this to follow his ideals. And he had one coin left and he thought, I better not. And then he went behind some building, found a place to, to sleep. And at sunrise, he woke up and the beggar was sleeping next to him. And he thought, hmm, I guess I've learned the ropes of where one, one can sleep in these villages. I now know like where the beggars sleep. And, and the guy was what was sleeping, you know, with his head with his with his hand outstretched. So Ed took his last coin, and he took it and he gently put it into the guy's hand. And and so it would be like a miracle to this beggar to wake up and he has money in his hand. And Ed left that village, and that was his uh, his epiphany when he had his last link, his last money, when it was finally gone, and it and and he. Um, was in total bliss. And that was really like the high point of his life, the moment that he gave it all, all away. Um, and I guess um, like, like most of the people in this virtual room, you can probably um, appreciate that and see the wonder in it, but to actually do it is really something else. Like when I traveled with, with Ed, you know, I was 21, I was, uh, you know, I was worried about it was my first time in, in India and I was afraid about hygiene and, you know, getting sick and and all. And so it's it, I felt really very, very lucky to have the experience of traveling with with such a with such a person. Um, Thank you so much, yeah. Thomas, for that very, very moving and transporting account. Let's just take a moment to breathe. So this is my last question. We have exactly 15 minutes left. And then at exactly 3 p.m. we will all go into breakout rooms where all of the participants can share 
their experiences with pilgrimage and reflections and what has come up for them during our call so far. <clears throat> I call this webinar the courage and magic of pilgrimage, um, especially with the word magic in there, precisely because of everything you've both just shared. You've extensively shown us the degree to which the experience of pilgrimage is completely alive with magic, with how the universe responds with so much grace when you say that I show up and I give myself to you. So much grace. Now, I want you to hold that grace in your mind and in your heart as I ask you this final question. What does pilgrimage with the earth mean to you at this time? At this time of an era drawing to a close, this liminal time and as somewhere we sense the stirrings of a new way to be and live begin to form and perhaps germinate in the future. What is that attitude of heart, mind, the capacity in the soul to undertake pilgrimage from one era to the next? What is the grace that you want to hold space for in that? How, how, how would you imagine that life would respond? Who would like to go first? Um, I I could start, I guess. Um, I think that something that pilgrimage teaches us is to really let let go and to let go of things and to let go of piling up things and to let go of uh, accumulating and a let go of the illusion of permanence. And I think that all of those things, all of the accumulation and all that, that comes with, with money and with uh, capitalism and with the ills of today are, are really at one of the real roots of it is also um, is the acquiring and people trying to build up things and to deny that things are actually transitory. And I think that when you are on a pilgrimage in such a way going through um you know even hard hardships which i think pilgrimage uh would in always in entail like you can't really take the, the the luxury bus to the holy site and have the same experience as if you walked there or you know went there with a lot of mishaps on the way that you had to overcome um i think that uh you know that's what what pilgrimage really would would at at base teach, and I think that it's that 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 sort of freedom from all of the encumbrances, from all of the things of this world and everything that we hold on to and believe. Like if we buy a house, we think it's our house, it's my house, but it's only temporarily your house, even though it's your house, and you've been there for many years or will be there for many more years. In the end, it's going to be. Uh, somebody else's house and it and so nothing is really permanent and I think that for for me I can just say that that's sort of the the bliss that can come with being on 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 the road and and walking in such a manner and not knowing where you're going to end up at the end of the day or whether you're going to have food or not food or a place and if it's going to rain what happens and all of that that if you um yeah you know and, and so that that um that to to me is one of the main things that pilgrimage can teach it's it's not even the 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 goal of it or 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 something actually here i i can i could just if i could um i i had a a quote from matsuo basho a japanese poet uh, in the front of the first book that I wrote, which actually told about my time on the mountain in, in Greece and then with Ed. And it says, the moon and sun 
are eternal travelers. Even the years wander on, a lifetime adrift in a boat or in old age leading a tired horse into the years. Every day is a journey and the journey itself is home. From the earliest times, there have always been some who have perished along the road. Still, I have always been drawn by wind-blown clouds into dreams of a lifetime of wandering. And I think for me, that sort of sums up a, a lot. I guess I've spent my whole life traveling. I'm writing, I'm talking to you right now from Bhutan and I'm, um, I own no house, I have no car. We travel a, a lot. And, um, and so I've sort of, in a way, spent my, my life in, in journey. Um, and a friend very early on when I was in, in college sent me a little quote that sort of said to the effect, I think it was from W.B. Yeats that, that, that said, it would be like you to have the dust of, of, of many lands on, on your shoes, something like, like that. And I guess I didn't even realize it at the time, but that is how my life's been. I've been traveling um, pretty much my whole life um, and feeling at, at home wherever I am or where my wife and I are, that home is where we are together and that's, and that's fine. And, um, and so I think it's something about the impermanence. And I think that everybody in their heart has a, a longing for that unencumbered state, whether they ever leave home or do more than take, a, take the dog for a walk around the block. Um, I think there's something deeply embedded in, in all of our hearts and, and that that to me is what pilgrimage is. And as Santos said, the entire life is a pilgrim. Like I've never been really interested in taking a pilgrimage to a holy site, like to go where Buddha sat and reached enlightenment wouldn't really interest me because it's not the tree, it's not the place, it's something inside yourself. And um, I guess you have to follow your very, your own very, uh, very personal course, you know, find out who, who you are, um, know, know thyself. And um, so I've never been part of any uh, organized re religion and I really doubt, I, I'm sure I never will. The path is very in individual for me, I guess, because I'm an individual Westerner maybe I, without a religious background. But I think there is a place for atheists who maybe have spiritual experiences or, or, or know that there's something more or have that sense of, of wonder of looking at the nighttime sky and looking up at all those stars and thinking, what is this all about? Who, who are we? What are we? And that to, to me is sort of the highest state of not knowing and of, and, and of wonder. And that is easier when you walk along the, the road without a destination. You can, it's, it's one of the methods for coming to, to realize that, so. Thank you so Thank much, you. Thomas. Okay. I mean, uh, Michelle, you talked about Earth. Uh, I made a film for the BBC called Earth Pilgrim. And uh, we, humanity at this moment, are living more like tourists than like pilgrims. And we think that Earth is there as a resource for humans. And uh, humans are somehow superior and above nature. And so all the natural phenomena is only a resource for our economic growth, for our high living standard, for our more production, more consumption, and so on and so on. So I think if, we, if the whole world, 8 billion people were to have this consciousness of pilgrim, then I think we will live more simple life, more frugal life, more life in harmony with nature. And we will not think that we and nature are separate. Nature and humans are not separate. We are made of nature. The word human comes from humus, and humus in Latin means soil. So human beings are, Michelle, literally soil beings. 
we are made of soil. We are made of earth, air, fire, water. And mountains, forests, animals, birds, all nature, including humans, are made of earth, air, fire, water. And also, we humans think that we have consciousness and nature has no consciousness. We seem to think that nature is a machine. Nature is a commodity. And that, I think, if we want to have a, a consciousness of pilgrim, then we have to change that. And we have to understand that nature is alive. Nature is a living organism. And nature has consciousness. Nature has imagination. William Blake, our great poet, he was a true pilgrim. He said, William Blake at Basho, a Basho in Japan, Thomas, William Blake in England said that nature is imagination itself. Shakespeare said the same thing. Tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and, and good in everything. That's a Shakespeare, as you like it. And so if we go to our poets like Basho, William Blake, Shakespeare, Tagore, and so on, they, are, they were all real pilgrims. So we have to live lightly on this earth in order to be pilgrims on this earth. To be an earth pilgrim, you have to have a light footprint. At the moment, the human footprint on the earth is very heavy, heavy footprint. And we are so discontented, never enough. America is economy number one in the world, and yet they want more economic growth. Britain is economy number four, and yet we are never satisfied, never contented, never enough. That's not the psychology of a pilgrim. We are living like a tourist and wasting, polluting, contaminating, and destroying our planet. So it is, pilgrimage is not just an ideal. Pilgrimage is not just a religious or spiritual ideal. It's a very pragmatic and practical necessity of our time to live like a pilgrim, frugally, simply, elegantly, lovingly, so that earth can sustain not only our generation, but many, many future generations to come. Because this earth has to sustain life for millions and millions of years to come. It's not just a five-year plan or 10-year plan or economic growth that we can have. And what kind of earth we are going to leave as a legacy for our future generation if we live like a tourist and contaminate and pollute and create global warming and climate change and ocean polluted and rivers polluted and soil poisoned, what kind of legacy we are going to leave for our future generations. So Michelle, pilgrimage is not only a beautiful ideal for the poets, it's the necessity of our time. We all have to become pilgrims if we are to survive and sustain our life Otherwise, I think we have a very bleak future. Thank you. Very powerful words. And right on cue, perfect timing too. So we'll just give it a minute. If we can please put people in breakout rooms. And I would like everybody to sit with everything that Satish has just offered everything that Thomas has just offered. And please sit with what does it mean for you to be an earth pilgrim at this time, to step lightly upon this earth. As Satish was saying, this is something that we are called to. This is not just a choice anymore. This is something we absolutely have a responsibility to step into and honor who we really are and what this time really needs. So please, please do let that percolate and then share with your fellow participants. Welcome back. How was that, Satish, your breakout room? I had a very nice uh, room chat with Susan Oakes and we had a very good discussion. It was very nice to meet her. Oh, lovely, lovely. Yes. So um, if Thomas is back as well, I would love for all the people who are still on the call to turn on their cameras, to unmute themselves. And Satish, how are you feeling? 
I'm feeling <laughs> fine. Uh, I'm feeling fine and a bit tired. Uh, I'm, 80, I'm 87, so so <laughs> it's a little bit. Um, but I can me add another 10, 15 minutes, and then uh, Thomas can continue. Okay, all right, that sounds good, Satish. Thank you so much for giving yeah. us your time. I wouldn't believe you were 87 when I called you earlier. Your hello <laughs> just electrified me. It was so full of life and just joyful. I was telling my my colleague after that I I wouldn't believe that you were 87. 87, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still continuing. I'm here to serve. Okay, so if people have any questions, Thomas, if you don't mind, I can go um, first and then I will leave in 10, 15 minutes and you can continue. Okay. Any questions from anybody? I, ha I have a question about um, um, being a leader of a pilgrimage. Is that at all possible? Can you lead a pilgrimage? I mean, you can be an inspiration. And sometimes great teachers like the Dalai Lama or some other people of that nature, they say, okay, we'll go on a pilgrimage, those who want to come. So because of their kind of uh, loving charismatic personality, people are drawn and then they go along with them. It's not leader as such. It's a kind of more inspiration and more kind of encouragement, sort of bringing people together. So you can, you can um, uh, inspire people, but uh, the word leader and follower is a bit more kind of difficult uh, in a kind of concept of pilgrimage. I think we are all pilgrims and we are all equal. Wherever we are, we start our journey from wherever we are, whichever point is not somebody ahead, somebody behind. We are where we are and we start our journey and the journey of a long um, distance and journey of thousand miles starts with one step and you take first step and second step and third step and there's no place that you are ahead or you are behind or there's no such thing. These are all kind of concepts. In the end, you are a pilgrim and there's no leader and no follower, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question? Thomas, you're muted. You're muted, Thomas. Is it okay if we take questions for um, Satish at the moment? Because he's only going to be on, on call. Oh, I I, I I had a question for him. I was gonna. I was asking <laughs> when when when's the last time you were on the road walking? I mean, Except I go on on walking on Dartmoor very often, and I go for one day, two days, seven days, whatever uh, d distance. Because Dartmoor is one of my great love. Because I live in Devon, it's such a beautiful place in neighborhood, and there are some Wisman's woods, very beautiful. There are many tours, uh, and then the rivers, the river Dart, East Dart, West Dart, and so uh, being on the river, being in the forest, being on the tours, being in the hills, in nature. Um, so that's a, I often go there as a as a kind of pilgrim, and this earth, this um. A film I made for BBC called Earth Pilgrim is also made on Dartmoor. And so that is my, but otherwise I made a pilgrimage to, uh, from Florence to Assisi. I made a pilgrimage around Britain for four months. Uh, so I started from Devon, Somerset, Winchester, and then Canterbury, and then on the East Coast, uh, Lincoln, York, Durham, Lindisfarne, to Scotland, Iona, and then on the West Coast through Wales, back to Devon. So four months journey again without any money and enjoying the hospitality of the British. You will be surprised to know that British are very helpful because again, for four months, I walked around Britain without any money, not a penny. And every night, every day, I was given hospitality around Britain. So I had a great experience. And I was just saying to Susan that for me, going on a pilgrimage is every place is holy. Every place is sacred. Nature is sacred. And so uh, I'm at home in a, in a cathedral. I'm at home under a tree. I'm at home by a river. 
I'm at home in a field. I'm at home on a hill. I am in a sacred, holy place, wherever I am. And so for me, uh, British Isles are as holy as Mount Kailash and Santiago de Compostela or Assisi. So, so wherever I am, I feel very, very at home as a pilgrim. Wow. Any other question? Yes, um, please. Yes. Ask. Sorry, I get, sh sh should I start asking? <laughs> Sarah, yes, yes. Um, that is, I just, oh, it's so wonderful hearing you. And I, I was just wondering, you know, as pilgrimage practice, just what you were saying then about, um, see, for example, if, if I were to walk from my home now, I mean, an unknown person just walking in a village, was that your experience when you say that, I mean, I'm just thinking in a city, the number of people on the streets that, that, no, no, I mean, I, I walk as an unknown person. I mean, now I'm a little yeah. known, but when I walked from India to America, nobody knew me, and and uh, I was only 26 uh, years old. Oh, no, I was thinking now, though. I was thinking now. Now, now you can. You can, As um, Michelle mm. started her uh, introduction, you need a bit of courage. Mm. You need a bit of trust in your heart. Mm. You have to trust yourself that mm. I can do it. Mm. Then you have to have a resolve. I will do it. Yes. <laughs> and then, then you have to say that it's not going to be easy. Mm. I'm not expecting everything to go smoothly without any problem, without any difficulty. And you have to, I, I say when I go on a pilgrimage, I say difficulties welcome, problems welcome. Mm. Somebody says, welcomes you, that's welcome. Somebody doesn't welcome you, you still bless them. So a pilgrim accepts ups and downs, yes. good and bad, uh, yes. low and high, with equanimity. So when you, ordinary person, just go with that resolve in your heart and say, whatever happens, I'll accept it. I'm not expecting everything to go smoothly and everybody should be nice and everybody should give me food, and everybody should give me a shelter, and everything will be fine. That's not the... Uh, no, that's not a pilgrimage. <laughs> that's a tourist. <laughs> you go pilgrimage without any expectation. Yeah. Without any expectation, you say, I'm going to be on a pilgrimage. Whatever happens, I'll welcome. And so sometimes difficulty, sometimes not difficulty. And you will be surprised how much, how much welcome and love you get. Because people are looking for pilgrims and want to help support pilgrims. And there are, there are many hosts, but not enough pilgrims. Oh, thank you. It's truly yeah. inspiring. <laughs> Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Maybe one last question. Yes, please. Um, hello, Satish. Yes, yes. Uh, you can hear me okay. Yeah. Uh, lovely to see you and hear from you. I, my question is really about you know, pilgrimage as individuals and pilgrimage in, in, um, walking in groups because both experiences can offer so much. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on that, the sort of benefits or pitfalls of the... Uh, traveling individually or traveling in groups and walking? I think both, both ways, I would say, are good. When I went uh, from India to America, that was with one other person. When I went around Britain, I was on my own. When I went to Camino, Santiago and Assisi, there were four, four or five people. So I've experienced both. And I think always, whatever way you do, in a way, out of all those pilgrimages, my experience of going with one other person was better because we could share, we could exchange ideas, we could exchange thoughts and reflections and, and opinions and, and support each other. So I would say if you are going on a long pilgrim, longer than say a month or two or three months, then I would say one other companion is a good idea. Uh, but, but, in whatever way, way comes naturally to you, just do it. And, and whatever, way, there's no one single perfect way. So you have to find your own way and which suits you. But as a kind of little advice, I would say uh, two people is, is best. Then you are not too many and not, not too few. <laughs> two minimum. Uh, that would be good. Okay. So if you can do that. But then I walked with this one other person for two and a half years. I had this resolve, both of us. We say, we are not going to criticize each other. We are not going to complain about each other. 
We are not going to compare each other. We will accept the other person as the other person is, warts and all. But we are not perfect. And we have to live together, stay together, walk together, and do everything together. And we can't do in mountains of Afghanistan and snow-covered villages of Russia, quarrel and argue and criticize and complain and say, you are not good and you need to do this. So we, we as pilgrims, we said, we are not going to judge each other. We will just accept each other as we are, warts and all, with our imperfection, with our shortcomings, whatever we are, we are. And let's be together as friends and support each other and walk together. With that result, for two and a half years, we stayed together without falling out and we are still friends. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you all of you for having me. And now I should have a little rest because I feel a bit tired. Uh, but it has a great pleasure to be with you all. And Thomas, thank you for uh, taking over and continuing until until um, maybe four o'clock. And then we will be in touch again sometimes. Uh, I was just saying to Susan, if you want to get my book, Pilgrimage for Peace, you can order through uh, resurgence.org. That's my magazine and Resurgence Trust. Resurgence.org. And they have my books, Pilgrimage for Peace, and also Radical Love, Elegant Simplicity, various books I have written, so you can order that. And my magazine, Resurgence, you can look at that. Thank you for inviting me, Michelle, and wish you all a wonderful life and a wonderful pilgrimage of life. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're deeply yes, honored uh, by your thank presence. You. Thank you. Satish, we'll put the link to the books in the follow-up email okay. as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Right. Hopefully you can make it to St. Ethelberg's in person. Yeah. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Bye-bye. <gasps> the floor is yours, Thomas. What should I do with it? <laughs> Take Dance all the questions. All the... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. This is part Any of our questions? contract. Maybe you're forgetting. It was in my email. <laughs> yeah. um, Claire, do you have any questions for Thomas? Maybe not. Anybody, whatever questions you have for Thomas, please, now's your chance. Maybe that's a very good state to be in, to have no questions. <laughs> oh, I'll ask you a question then. Okay. <laughs> the cat's going to walk on the keyboard, though, just All right. <laughs> All right. I was just wondering, oh, I was wondering, I mean, listening, uh, when you were talking about um, your colleague with whom you walked, Ed, well, yes. colleague's the wrong word, friend, companion, yeah. and I just wondered, I can't, can't imagine how, how it was to leave to separate at the end or did you, did you retain contact? Well, I suppose you wouldn't retain contact. No, I actually that kind did. kind of a person or did you? No, he, he ended up, um, I, I actually, the first time I went to India with him and then we went traveling and then I, I, I did um, set out on my own out after that. And when we left, when, when I left him, I had asked him where I should go, where I could meet somebody. And he, he had known, um, I don't know if any of you know, uh, Lama Anagarika Govinda, who wrote mm -hmm. some early books on, on Tibetan Buddhism. And so he suggested that I go up to his place in Almora. And I ended up going up there, and he had left. He had actually um, he had developed par Parkinson's and went to, um, to California, I think, and he ended up dying there. He was, he was quite old, but he had given the the land over to a Tibetan Lama and I ended up living with this Lama and his wife and, and children for the next winter. Um, and then I, after that, I left India and it was, um, it was how many, about three years later, I decided quite suddenly to return to, to India. And when, when, when he and I first went to India, we, we first stayed in Bombay with a family, a friend of his, friends mm -hmm. of, of his, and so I went back to that house. I nobody knew that I was coming, and I I just walked into their house, and there was Ed sitting there, and he had been oh, living goodness. over in on in in Bihar, and he he just he always had a toothpick in in, in his mouth. He was always so he always sort of ruminating with his with his toothpick, and he was just sitting there, and he said, "I thought you would be coming," 
And he had actually traveled over to Bombay back to this family's house because he had the feeling that I would be coming. Oh my goodness. It, so it totally blew my mind. You know, I, I was like so excited to be back. You know, I was what, you know, 23 years old or 24 or something. I was a young guy and I walk in there and there he is. And then we ended up uh, then going up to Almora um, where he used to live and I used to, to live. And then we went walking up, up in the Himalayas together and did another walking tour, um, which lasted probably about a week. I, I always felt with him, it was, it was sort of like as if, uh, like if you meet some great uh, yogi or meditator who sits in a cave without moving or eating for weeks on end, and you just go to visit him and you just sit down in the cave with him and you're expected to just be able to exist on the level that he's existing on. It was always a little bit like that traveling with Ed. When we were in Bombay with this family, it was this big extended family. It was always wonderful. We would sit there and we were taken care of by this family, of, of, of course, and the women were wonderful cooks and we would sit there and philosophize and and it was always a, a, a beautiful experience. But then you'd hit the road with him and it was like being with an ascetic. And I'm not an ascetic, but I really feel like I was really blessed by having the experience of traveling with him. And I later, you know, had, I did later after all of that, I went up to Sikkim, which is, I don't know if you know where it's up in, mm, not yes, too far yes. from where I am now, a mm. beautiful mountainous place. Mm. <clears throat> and um, in sort of in the, in, in the spirit of Ed Spencer, I, it was just a wonderful rural place of little villages and, really kind people. So I thought it would be a good place to do such a walk again. And so I really went and having no, like really in, in his spirit going, having no idea where I was going and people were very kind and, and, and very, uh, yeah. And, and it was sort of magical in, in a way because I was out about two or three days when I was walking and I got to a forking in, 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 in the road. And always, if you have no destination, there's always this weird experience of coming to a fork in the road and which way are you, are you going? And this man came up to me and said, you know, are you going to, to, I had taken the, the left branch just because it looked nicer or something. And this man came up to me and said, you know, are you going to Timi, which is the name of this village, the one tea garden in, in Sikkim? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, is this road going to, to Timi? He said, yes. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to Timi. And he said, well, you're lucky because that monk over there is going to the village. You can follow him. And I just started following this This, this monk who sort of went off the side of the road onto this little footpath through all these bamboo groves and fields and ended up at this at this village. And I was and this monk kind of disappeared in, into a house and a man came out and I asked him, you know, is there any place, you know, where one could sleep here or, you know, and he told me that their teacher, their guru, their God, their this Lama was coming to this very house and I could stay there with them. And I ended up staying there and meeting this, the, the, this Lama. And I ended up um, spending a lot of time with this Lama. I actually wrote a, a book called The Master Director about this Lama. He's like the big guru of the Darjeeling Hills. And as you've maybe gotten the idea, I'm not somebody to follow a guru, mm -hmm. but I was like the chosen disciple, so to speak, because he had never been around a Westerner and he was interested in how my mind worked. And I was watching this whole scene around this incredible mm -hmm. guru who actually, I think, really was like one of these Himalayan masters. He sort of had it from the time he was uh, a little child. He was already seen. He had just had extraordinary understanding. And um, and so I ended up spending a lot of time with him. And whenever I was in the area for the next three years, I would immediately be traveling with him and going to these big uh, pujas, these 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 big rituals that he would be running with sometimes thousands of of people. And always he would have me in 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 the car with him, and then I'd be alone in the room with him, and and just had another one of these amazing experiences in, in a way I've been very lucky I think or I don't know what but to have met quite a few people in my life that have had that sort of a I don't know what to even call it but um extraordinary um realized people in in a way 
and to have, uh, by circumstance, been able to have close relationships with, with them and really spend time with them. Like with Ed, you know, he was really extraordinary. And, and this Lama also um, was really, I think, really like a, like a saint in, in a certain way. Um, and it wasn't always easy with, with him because I was always struggling and questioning. I always question, you know, mm -hmm. my name is Thomas. So like I'm Thomas the, the doubter and I doubt everything. You know, I always feel like if I go to where there's some teacher, it's like I always bring my anvil in and I start pounding it to see if it's real, real gold or not. Mm. I don't take it very easily. But and, and then, of course, because I'm a writer, I've, um, you know, written books about all my experiences with these with these people. Like with Ed, I wrote a book called Into the Hands of the Unknown and um the monk in the slide, chickpeas, and I went about the my time on the mountain with this Greek Orthodox monk, and and on and on. So I've I've somehow, um, yeah, I've 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 run into these people and um, have been able to have you know some real experiences with them. So I've been very lucky in that way. It's been interesting. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thomas, I have a question here from Amy. Okay. Amy's saying, I'd, I'd love to hear, how do you balance the idea of pilgrimage and the search and longing for more inherent in these journeys with the idea that we are never satisfied as a society forward slash and needing to feel into enoughness? Would love to hear any thoughts on this. The questions in the uh, so I suppose she's asking, how do you balance the idea of pilgrimage and the longing inherent within it with um maybe maybe balance is not the right maybe she means how how do you comport the idea of pilgrimage and the longing within it with the idea that we're never satisfied as a society? that we you know there's so much greed in our society there's so much consumerism restlessness i think that's what yeah. she's getting yeah well i think i've sort of covered that a bit in, in in a way by um like i i actually don't um think so much in terms of pilgrimage even though this is the the topic of tonight's or today's wherever you are on the planet's um discourse here um I guess I always, I, I think of, um, I mean, like when I was traveling, I never really thought of it as a pilgrimage, actually, um, because I always connote pilgrimage with some sort of a destination, like it's a pilgrimage to somewhere. And I guess for me, it's always um, the moments of, of, of bliss of being on, on, on the road has has always been when I give up the idea of a destination. And so I guess for me, that would be a pilgrimage would ne has never been, I mean, it's different for different people, has never been a pilgrimage to somewhere. It's been just like the the movement, the the going. And, and in that way, it, it is that sense of, um, of not holding on to anything, not even a destination, to realize that it's the present moment, that it's all happening now. And I think with that understanding would naturally, I think, come with not quite trying to uh, uh, acquire too much and to build up too much, which is, I think, where all of our troubles come in. Like, I think, you know, simple, um, like Gandhi once said, you know, s simple, uh, simple living high thinking. So I think it, it, it's harder, like, you know, Jesus said, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle or something like that. And I think that it's, it, it sort of gets down to the, to the idea of, um, you know, of, of letting go, of not acquiring, of letting go of security. I think security is also something that you give up in a in a pilgrimage because you don't have that stability it's like going into the unstable and, and into the letting go and i think probably you know the real root of the disastrous place where we all are really at the pre at the precipice i sometimes get the feeling 
of our civilization and our, which is now world worldwide. I think it really comes from people wanting to uh, acquire and want more and think that you gain happiness through acquisition. And um, I think, you know, ultimately, if you're not attached to your acquisitions, then probably it's not an evil, but people tend to be um, attached to what they have and what they want. And we're all guilty of this to varying to degrees. So I think it's to let go of some, some, somehow. I don't know. I think that's would be my answer. Thank you, Thomas. Anybody else have a question or reflections? Well, <clears throat> Stephen has his hand raised. Hi, Stephen. Hi, hi, Thomas. I, I was wondering if we are coming into a time of, of collapse, do you think that there are particular lessons that, you know, either from your personal experience or that pilgrimage generally has to teach to, you know, to the people who will experience the, you know, collapse and not having available to them all the comforts that they have had? Uh, um... I don't know. I I I don't know. Um, maybe re rephrase your your question. Make it. I mean, do, do you think it would be helpful? I mean, I suppose I'm wondering. I you know whether just my experience of pilgrimage and enjoying having very little. It, it showed me how pleasurable it can be to to not have stuff. And to yeah to to live simply with with the, with the company of others, and I'm, I I suspect we are coming into a time of collapse when people may be forced to live more more simply, but they, they may they may find the pleasures of living more simply. Right, or 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 they might um, start trying to grab from others because they haven't get, get given up. That's what I would be afraid of. Like it, it wouldn't be a lot of fun to live through the time of, of collapse, which is probably coming. So I think that there's a lot one could learn from the idea of pilgrimage or whatever you would want to call it. This idea of, you know, simple living, simple living, high, high thinking. Um, but um, I sort of fear for what's coming. Personally, I, I, I really fear for what's coming. And sometimes I try to be philosophical about it and think of it in uh, Asian or, you know, Indian terms where they have these re recurring cycles of, you know, these great eons and kalpas and, and all of this. And at the end comes dissolution and then re renewal like this, you know, like the autumn and winter into spring and all of that. I try to enter entertain that and try not to, uh, like, don't be uh, attached even to the downfall. But what I always find that doesn't really work for me because I see there's a lot of human suffering on the way down. And there's, I, you know, there's just a lot. And it's, you know, with all the climate change and everything that we all know, the wars, the instability, the rising of fascists around the, the world and dictators that seem to be, you know, the roots of democracy seem to be shaking. I think we all see that and it's rather frightening. And so I, I do sometimes try to be philosophic about it and to stand above it and say, well, everything comes and everything goes and that's all okay. But it really isn't because I am still concerned about individuals and there are individuals. We all will suffer and some who are less buffered against it will suffer greatly. And um, so there's a lot that could be learned, but I, I also think that the average Joe, when he loses his stuff, will go to the next guy's house and try to grab it. I think that's also human nature, um, un unfortunately. Um, so there's a lot that could be learned. That That's what I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thomas, um, I'm intrigued. You're, you're in Bhutan, and I happen to be going there next week. Very uh -huh. exciting. Um, okay. but but what I wanted to ask was, I mean, with all we're talking about attachment and so forth, um, and, and one's huge concerns for, for what lies ahead inevitably, um, is there that feeling there in, in Bhutan, the happiest country in the world, 
Um, is that feeling <laughs> um, really one of um, attach? Is there attachment there? Is it? Is it? Is that? Is that why you're there? Are you just there temporarily? How is it over there? Um, we've just been here. My 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 wife and I are are here. We've just been here over a week, right. and we're going to be uh, teaching at a, a college here. I'll be teaching kind of creative writing and writing, and she'll be doing some kind of grant grant writing help with with the faculty. Um, so we're actually going to be here for quite a few months, which is which is a wonderful situation. And so we've been here about a week. We just found a place um, right now. Um, in like a hotel room and we just found a house to live in we'll be moving in Sunday so we'll have our own kitchen which is wonderful but I must say that at the moment I'm, I'm sort of uh, in, enchanted by this place mm -hmm. I find the people very very uh, very kind and and very somehow very thoughtful and on you know that's a generalization but I do find it very uh, it's very clean compared to India mm -hmm. and um yeah, I'm really excited to be here. It's really a wonderful experience. It's not easy to to get in and to be able to get, you know, a long-term visa yeah. to to do such a thing, but we sort of had some connections and and we've done it. Um so um yeah, I think you'll you'll have a how how, how long will you be here for? 3 weeks. Just just 3 weeks. <laughs> 3 weeks. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> not for yeah, a long. Good. Yeah, it's quite an extraordinary place, I, I think, yeah. 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 Nice, nice people, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your, your question or? Yes, I mean, it's probably, you. yeah, you certainly gave, gave a sense. Uh, no, it's just, it's maybe it will give hope, hope for the world being in a place like that, be inspiration. Right, but they, they, they have their own problems here. Like a lot of the young people, okay. there's a mass exodus to Australia. Australia gives people from Bhutan easy work visas, and there's a total exodus uh, at the moment. Like mm -hmm. there's economic problems. and it, It's not all um, as the tourist brochures would have it either. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's like everywhere. It's, it's a real complicated mixed, mixed bag. But um, I just find the people really, really nice and very honest and very, there's almost like an innocence to, to, to people here, especially after being in India, which mm -hmm. has a very different atmosphere to it. It's very dirty in here. It's very clean. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, like much more of a developed place. People are well-educated, much, much better educated. So thank anyway. you. Please jump in, anybody else? Annie, do you have a question? Sorry to pick on you. You just seem so reflective in that moment. I was trying to think of, um, I had, I have something, but I'm not sure how to phrase it. So, um, but I was going to ask, uh, uh, something along the lines of how how did you well have you always um because you were talking earlier Thomas about how you've um always um been traveling and and never uh, kind of put roots down in a, a specific place um and I was wondering like how how that happened or how do you like choose choose where to go or like um yeah what does could you like give give a kind of picture of what that looks like right. yes right um i guess i've um i how to put it i i've um it, it's usually sort of circumstance or my writing projects like like what brought me to darjeeling um, was really, I was looking to go to somewhere where I would, I didn't know what, but I was looking for some writing project, something to write. It was an interesting place. I actually went there originally because I thought there were some Bhutanese monasteries in Darjeeling. And I thought if I connected myself up there, maybe taught English, this was years ago, that I could then come to Bhutan. And that was like, that was about 20 years ago. And now I finally find myself in, in, in Bhutan. But 
you know, I really went there and I just started living in there and I ended up about 10, 10 years there um, from about 2000, I guess, the year two, 2000 and met my wife Barbara there in, in Darjeeling. Um, and uh, we, we lived there for quite a few years and I wrote two, two books out of it. One was um, A Step Away from, from, from Paradise, which was this story of a, of a llama who had visions and uh, that he was the one to open up a hidden valley of immortality up on Mount Katanjunga, which is in this, on the Sikkim Nepal border and went with 300 people who all gave up their, their houses and, and all. And so I ended up spending years tracking down the, the surviving disciples who went with him. And they were all quite elderly at, at that time and put the whole story together and, and did, you know, research on, on all of that. And, um, but so it's often been, um, you know, different writing projects and I guess, um, you know, we're based in, in, in Austria now. My, my wife is an anthropologist, a medical anthropologist studying uh, Tibetan medicine. And, um, and she's based at the University of, of in uh, Vienna. So we are based there. And then she has field work in India. And I've been writing stories about India. So we've been back and forth between there for, for quite a while. And we were based in Berlin for a while. And so we were there and also living in India a lot of the time. So it's sort of um, it's sort of like like being um, nomads, but nomads usually have set ways that they go, you know, and they have their their summer meadows and their winter places, and ours is a bit more erratic than that. But um, yeah, I've it's been really interesting, you know. So, sometimes I go into someone's house and I see their big bookshelf full of books, and I have a longing. You know, like the grass is greener on the other side, you know, to have a bookshelf full of books, whereas we digitalize books and carry them with us that that way. So we have our libraries with us and don't have a lot of possessions like we, we really don't. Um, but we're together wherever we are because I'm writing books and so I can be anywhere. And She has more constraint by her university research positions. And so, um, you know, we're able to work it out that way. So um, it's just sort of happened. I, it hasn't, none of it's really, really planned, but um, it, it's, 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 it's been interesting. I mean, we really, we really have, we have a unusual life. I would say I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else because it might not work and you might be in real trouble then, but somehow I've always been just really lucky in the way that it just unfolds and has worked out. I don't know why, but it's, um, I sort of, it sometimes seems like if you really follow your, your way, if you follow your bliss, if, if you do go on that pilgrimage and don't be afraid to go through that door, it, it, it can work. That would be, um, I wouldn't say that it does work because I wouldn't advise somebody to leave everything behind and go because you wouldn't want to be responsible for, for someone crashing their, their, their life or something, but um, it can work. And I would advise people just to go for it. You know, we're not here very long on this planet. And what are we here for? We don't even know. So it's like explore yourself, find, find out what it's all about in what little way that you can or open up questions and don't look too much for answers. And um yeah, just just follow that. So that's what I would say. Any final reflections from anyone or a final question? Do you have any parting thoughts, Thomas? We have four minutes left. Okay. Um parting parting thoughts. I, I had something that I thought of when when uh, when Satish was talking about how um, how everything is he, when he was talking about which I had never known the uh, human coming from the same root as humus or the earth and that there's no demarcation between conscious and unconscious was just one thing that happened to me. I actually just told this to the little group that I was with, but I will say it again because I think it's sort of somehow fits or or so but um during the pandemic my wife and i we actually went to greece 
and we were living, we actually spent two, two years on a little obscure island at the very furthest end, end of it in a little stone house. And, um, and I used to go at night, there was like a, a, a little field off to the side and look up at the, at the stars. And it was just the, the most darkest sky without any kind of light pollution. And it was just, the universe was very deep there. Like, like you could really see millions and millions of stars when it was, when it was clear. And I used to go out there sometimes. And one night I was out there and I, um, I was sort of struck by the idea or, or, or the, the knowing that it's all made out of the same stuff, that we're made out of the same stuff as, this, as the stars and, and that it's all alive, that it's not like it's dead matter stars and we're alive, but that we're all alive. And so I actually, I normally don't talk to myself when I'm alone, but I was just so moved by it that I was looking up there and I just said aloud, it's all alive. Mm -hmm. And just at that moment, this huge shooting star went right across my field of vision where, where I was looking. And it was one of these big ones that has sort of like the angel dust behind, like it was breaking up and shattering and making this beautiful show and then disappearing be behind it. And it was, I guess for me, that was sort of the, the total confirmation that it's all alive, that we're, it's all one it's one thing and it's all made up of, of consciousness, whatever that, that is, or of awareness that it's as, that it's all one thing. And I think that that's pretty much what we're all sort of longing for is, is that sense of, that lived sense of oneness, that awareness of oneness that, that we maybe had as we were children and we may, you know, find again once we're gone, if we merge into something that it all is, but I think everybody has this longing for merger, I I think somewhere in them, looking for that for that hidden place, for that hidden hidden land where everything is good, where where it's all it's all one, it's all connected, it's all love and all of that. So that would be my my parting shot. Is this right? As of saying, it's all one. You know, it's it's all alive, and just to remember that it's all alive. You know, it it it's a we don't know what consciousness is. We don't know what this awareness or self-reflection is, but it's it's all there so, somehow if we can just let ourselves be simple and realize it. So that's my final shot there. With that parting gift of the awareness of awareness itself, I bid you all uh, farewell, I suppose. It will be wonderful to see your faces again. Please go well. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> Huge. Thank you. <laughs>